Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. A long time ago, I told a witness that I would tell the story of his encounter, and I figure late is better than never. For the sake of full disclosure, I did a significant amount of editing to his report. We'd be here for days if I didn't. But the events and wording are entirely accurate to the report and text I received. Bob, I was only 15 when it happened. It was 1999. I have never really claimed to know 100% what it was that happened, but it has been on my mind forever. Like a bad dream. We were at a campsite some two hours southeast of Knoxville, Tennessee. It is incredibly picturesque. We made this trip, usually a couple times a year, both before and after my experience. My parents slept in the RV, and I slept in the tent, because I thought it was real camping. It was the first night there on a long weekend. It was maybe 1 or 2 a.m. when I woke up to hear this hushed or muffled moaning in between really fast gibberish. It was really fast, really, really fast. It sighed and moaned between this fast talking. The gibberish was more like syllables than words. I wasn't awake for more than a couple seconds before it started messing with the tent. It ended up not opening the tent with the zipper, but the fabric along the zipper was creased and weaker than the rest. It tore the tent open, not opening the zipper, but tearing the fabric along the zipper line where the fabric was weakest. As soon as there was a big enough opening, the chatter turned into what I'd say sounded a lot like a whinny from a horse. I have never been so scared since. I remember my stomach turning, exactly like a drop on a roller coaster. I hid in the sleeping bag. I couldn't see anyway. I just flipped the top of my sleeping bag over my head and squeezed it tightly. I tried to curl into a ball. Then it came inside the tent. It smelled like garbage. Like old hot poultry in the trash. I know how crazy this sounds, but it laid right on top of me. There wasn't much pressure on my body, so it must have been on all fours, or supporting itself on its elbows. It used what I still call to this day, hands, to feel out my shape in the sleeping bag. I had balled up in my sleeping bag as soon as I heard the tent tear. I covered my face. I saw nothing the entire time. I remember very distinctly that the touching got even softer once it felt its way to my face. As soon as those fingers got to my chin, it whinnied again, just like a horse, and started talking fast. I remember it smelling my face through the sleeping bag, and that it was feeling out my facial structure. I think its face was pressing right into the sleeping bag, and I could hear the material rubbing on skin or hair. It sounded like it breathed through a wall of snot in its nose. I don't know why I didn't start earlier, but at this point I started screaming. Absolutely screaming. This has at most been 15 seconds since it first woke me up. It may have been even less, though. Then it ran away, and I heard the RV door open, and my dad shouted, Hey! I don't know if it turned around inside the tent, or reversed, but it's amazing it never stepped on me. It was not a big tent. That's what made it so creepy, both at the time and thinking back on it. It was treating me very tenderly, as if I was important or valuable to it. My dad. So this is where it gets strange. My dad didn't think it was a big deal. I remember he was surprised that I wouldn't spend the rest of the night in the tent or any of the following nights. He said it was a big old dog. Not just from my story, I mean. He said he saw it run away. A big old skinny dog is what he said. He said that it had smelled my jerky, which I didn't have, or my M&Ms, which I did have, and that it was just sniffing my face, as dogs do. I asked what breed this dog he saw was. He said he didn't know. But if he saw it, how did he not know what kind of dog it was? I don't think he actually saw a dog. I think he thinks he saw a dog. The way the light turned on outside the RV was kind of useless because it shined right into the little awning thing. So if the awning was down, which it was, the light just shined into the canvas. 
There was a good three or four seconds between when I screamed, causing it to leave, and my dad opening the door and yelling hey. From where I'm standing, that three or four seconds was long enough for whatever it was to have been out of direct sight of my dad, or at least out of the light. Here's the other troubling part, I guess. My dad is interested in all things paranormal. He invokes the name of Art Bell as if it were a religious deity. To my dad, how the pyramids couldn't have been built by humans with no help is standard conversation. So I just don't get why he is so convinced that it was a dog. I don't think it was a dog. To this day, I don't think it was a dog. No dog can make that chatter, and no dog has hands like that. And I've been around big smelly dogs all my life. And this was not wet, musty dog smell. Plus, I remember it feeling like it was completely covering me with its body, without actually putting any weight on me, if that makes sense. Plus, I remember feeling lips. Plus, it had hands. Plus, I wouldn't call them words, but I would call that chattering language of some kind. I have never brought this up to my dad without him laughing at me like I'm crazy. One time we were driving together, and a lady was walking a big dog, and my dad covered my eyes, and he shouted, Don't look, don't look, it's Bigfoot. Or if a big dog is on TV, he'll stare at me with grave concern, to tease me. Maybe it just hurts because I could probably convince my dad that the movie E.T. is based on actual events, if I tried hard enough. Honestly, if this thing just started beating me, I feel like it would have been a lot less traumatic. At the time and looking back, I remember feeling like it was treating me as though I was precious. Like I was very important. I've had chills since the first line of this. This was the Smokies. Are you familiar with Politis? I think I was close to being one of those. Like I think I already said. I remember it like it was a bad dream. I don't think it was a dream. But that's how my memory sees it. In that dream format if that makes any sense. In those moments, I was acting under pure animal instinct. That smell, that chatter, and the way it was pressing down on me are all things I'll never forget. It was the only time I ever understood the meaning of sick with fear, and I hope it never happens again. My stomach just plunged. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I spoke with this gentleman years ago, and his story left an impression on me as well. I asked if maybe his dad was determined to make him think it was a dog, as to not permanently scar him from the outdoors. He said something along the lines of, no, if that was the case, his dad would have investigated himself, and certainly wouldn't have encouraged him to stay in the tent overnight again. He also mentions, honorably I thought, how his memory of the event is not perfect. He recalls being some 70 feet away from the camper, and his dad laughed and said that the tent was more like 20 feet away at most. This kind of report long predates Europeans in America, and it continues to this day, something interested in the vulnerable. So the question can be asked, what does the described behavior of this report indicate? Primates, humans included, have arguably the most useless offspring in the animal kingdom, the foal seen here is just about 24 hours old, and already it can trot around and take direction from its mother. A newborn crocodile is very much as dangerous as an adult crocodile, relative to its size, of course. On the other hand, a human newborn cannot even nurse without literally having its head supported. The utter and total dependence that human babies and similar babies have on whoever is caring for them creates a strong bond between offspring and caregiver. When that bond is broken, radical behavior is known to follow. Is it possible that these creatures, in the face of the loss of offspring, lose their marbles a bit and seek out the closest replacement they can? Maybe not even to raise as their own, but just even to be near for a little while. Powerful hormones are released in a mother's brain by the very sight and sound of a baby they've bonded with. And if that precious face is no more, the withdrawal of those hormones are very much like any other withdrawal, and can cause impulsive, erratic, and irrational behavior. A video went viral of baboons keeping dogs as pets, and I'm very skeptical of this wording. Clearly the dogs and baboons 
cohabitate to some extent, but interaction between the two doesn't really indicate that one is domesticated to the needs of the other. But this primate did have pets. Coco cared for five cats over some forty years. She named them All Ball, Lipstick, Smokey, Miss Black, and Miss Gray. The first three she chose were all multicolored. The two she picked out in 2016 were solid color. Something she thought was worth noting, apparently. She named All Ball because, as she begged to get her first kitten, she seemed to like to put her stuffed toy cat on her head. Just like she did her ball. I guess she always envisioned a kitten sitting on her head. What I'm trying to say in so many words is that the great apes, no doubt, think smaller animals are cute. They may, like us, have a strong desire to nurture. It's clearly something that Coco, at least, put a lot of thought into. Of course, other great apes think smaller primates are tasty. Anyway, make sure to like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.